new developments in the continuing Vatican financial scandal. Plus, Pope Francis appoints the first layperson to manage the assets of the Holy See. Theologian and author of the new book, The Next Pope, George Weigel joins us with analysis. Father's Day is coming, and we'll look at the deep bond between dads and their kids. Pediatrician and author of You've Got This, Unleashing the Hero Dad Within, Dr. Meg Meeker will share her insight. And actor, director, philanthropist, and author Gary Sinise tells us how he found his calling serving our nation's military. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We're delighted you're with us. George Weigel, Dr. Meg Meeker, Gary Sinise, and more are straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. First, some news. Earlier this month, Vatican police arrested Italian businessman Gianluigi Torzi who was involved in the controversial London real estate deal on suspicion of extortion, fraud, and money laundering. The scandal broke last October when Vatican police raided the Secretariat of State and the Vatican's financial watchdog agency. Half a dozen Vatican officials were suspended. Last week, the Financial Times reported they have seen contracts, banking records, and the accounts of people with direct knowledge of the Vatican's financial affairs, they suggest that the deal with Mr. Torzi was approved by some of the major senior officials at the Vatican, including Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin. This revelation casts doubts on the Vatican's official narrative that the controversy surrounding this London property was the work of Torzi and a handful of junior administrators who were all suspended during the investigation. For more on all of this and to talk about his new book, we're joined by papal biographer, author of The Next Pope, The Office of Peter and the Church in Mission. Please welcome George Weigel back to the program. George, I want to begin with this news reported by the Financial Times. Three weeks before Italian investor Gianlu Gianluigi Torzi, his company took control of that Chelsea property in question. Cardinal Parolin, the Vatican Secretary of State, authorized his deputy, Venezuelan Archbishop Edgar Peña Para, to take control of the Secretariat's bank accounts. Then on November 28th, uh, Peña Para sent a request for payment to be made, and that resulted in the building, that building in London, to be transferred to Torzi's Luxembourg Shell Company. Where does this leave us, George Weigel? Originally, the Vatican said Torzi acted alone. I think it underscores, Raymond, a point that I make in this book, The Next Pope, and that is that you can shift boxes around on an organization chart uh, forever. But what really counts in reforming the finances of the Holy See uh, it is the character of the people involved with those finances. And The Next mm -hmm. Pope, as his predecessors have tried to do, has got to put in place people who are committed to financial probity, to transparency in the Vatican's financial transactions, and who know something about money. There is no reason yeah. to think that a papal diplomat has particular skills in finance. I've seen a, a flow chart of this Chelsea deal it's more complicated than the flowchart that was going around a few months ago trying to demonstrate how a guy making bat soup in China ended up creating a toilet paper shortage in San Diego. I mean, it's an <laughs> unbelievably complicated mess. But beneath that mess is a lesson that I underscore in the section of this book on Vatican reform, and that is character. Mm -hmm. Character is the crucial variable in Vatican administrative and financial reform. Well, relative to that, the other figure embroiled in all of this is the previous substituto, Giovanni Angelo Becciu, now Cardinal Prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. 
what comes of the trial here, George? And where does this place Cardinal Pell's warning, the previous head of that economic secretariat, you know, he tried to implement all sorts of reforms. Where do we situate him in all of this now, in light of what's uh, come to pass? Yeah, I was speaking to Cardinal Pell just about a week ago. Uh, he believes, and I believe, there is a lot more that remains to come out uh, mm -hmm. on the Tortsi story or through the Tortsi arrest uh, and his eventual trial. But it seems to me, and I immediately say I am no expert in international finance, mm -hmm. but it does seem to me that Cardinal Pell has been thoroughly vindicated in his reformist efforts. He attempted to get a lot done quickly. A lot of people criticized him for that, and some people were obviously made uncomfortable by it. But when we now see just how tangled this web is, and more to the point, how it undercuts, damages the evangelical mission of the church, then the more it seems clear to me that Pope Francis did the right thing in bringing in a knowledgeable guy with a lot of courage, like Cardinal Pell, uh, to try to mm -hmm. sort this out. Uh, and that that is going to have to happen going forward in the future. Mm. Pope Francis just appointed the first layman ever to run the administration of the patrimony of the Holy See, a former Ernst, Ernst and Young executive. He, he will be managing all of those assets. Will he be allowed to do the job he was appointed to do, George? That's the real question here. I mean, Cardinal Pell tried to move many of these initiatives, and then they were pulled back. Now we're re-implementing them again. It seems. Uh, I have no idea whether this man is going to be allowed to do what he's supposed to do. Uh, his reputation is a, is a fine one. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think we have to uh, get to grips now and in the future with the fact that there are systemic problems in Vatican finance, that there are attitudes towards money uh, mm -hmm. that need to be rooted out uh, of the Holy See. Uh, and that there has to be a consolidation of Vatican assets so we know what we're talking about here. I mean, the, the yeah. notion that there's 300 million euros here and 250 million euros there and, you know, who knows what all, this was part of what Cardinal Pell was trying to sort out. But you're dealing with deeply entrenched bureaucratic interests, and that, to come back to where I started, is why character— is the crucial variable in all of right. this. And it has to be addressed because the church has to be seen to be living what it proclaims. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of character, George, uh, a June 13th report by Crux, later confirmed by CNA, Argentinian Bishop Gustavo Zanchetta, no unfamiliar name on this show, a close friend of Pope Francis, has returned to work at the Vatican Central Bank. He is still under investigation, George, for sexual improprieties with seminarians back in Argentina. How is it possible, given Zanchetta's well-known history, that he's back on the job while still under investigation? Seems uh, seems strange to me, Raymond. I I don't I haven't followed the Zanchetta case uh, closely. Uh, it does seem to me to send a very bad uh, signal uh, in a church that is desperately trying to get its arms around the problem of clerical sexual abuse to address this. Why? Because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's essential to the proclamation of the gospel. The church mm -hmm. has to be seen to live what the church proclaims if that proclamation is going to have any credibility. That's what's yeah. at stake and in all of this, whether it's sexual propriety or financial propriety. Mm -hmm. And this is at the heart of your message in your new book, The Next Pope. And it really is, uh, the subtitle is The Office of Peter and the Church in Mission. Now, you say in that book, George, the Catholic Church will be crossing into uncharted territory in the next pontificate. What do you mean by that? And why did you feel it necessary to write a book like this now, really an action plan for the next pontificate? 
Uh, I mean two things by it, Raymond. As you and I have discussed on, on your program many times, we're in the midst of the fifth great epical transition in Catholic history, this time the, church, the transition from the Church of the Counter-Reformation to the Church of the New Evangelization. We've been in that transition for more than 100 years now, and it's one of the reasons why there's so much turbulence in the Church. But within that transition, there's another transition coming up. Uh, the next pope will not have been a man who experienced the Second Vatican Council, which accelerated this turn into the new evangelization in the way that John Paul II, Benedict XVI, or Pope Francis experienced. The next mm -hmm. pope might have been a teenager at the time of Vatican II, could even have been a child at the time of Vatican II. So it seemed to me that it might be helpful to the whole church, as well as, I hope, to those responsible uh, for choosing the successor of Peter, to ask in this small book, what have we learned over the past 50 years? What seems to be fruitful for the proclamation of the gospel? Where is the church living and why? And where is the church dying and why? And that's what I've tried to lay out in a, in a very straightforward, I hope, non-polemical uh, way. Uh, and I hope that that does indeed provide a template for thinking about the entire Catholic future, but also about uh, the future of the office of Peter. Mm. In your book, you say the next pope must be fully committed to the new evangelization as the church's grand strategy in this 21st century. You write this, the Catholic Church does not exist by itself or for itself. The Catholic Church exists because of the salvific design of God, which is the interior truth of history and the cosmos. And the Catholic Church exists to proclaim Jesus Christ and his gospel. Now, based on history and the current state of the church today, do you think a new evangelization will be the greatest challenge the next pope will have to deal with? Well, it's the challenge that every pope deals with, and that's been true since St. Peter gave the first Catholic sermon on the first mm -hmm. Christian Pentecost. Um, it's what's striking to me now, Raymond, is that if you look around the world church, which is a very complicated place, talking about mm -hmm. 1.3 billion people in every imaginable cultural circumstance, and yet amidst that complexity, uh, some things are quite clear, at least seem to me quite clear, and I try to explain them uh, in this book. The first thing that's clear is that the church that has embraced the gospel, that proclaims the gospel boldly, with compassion, which offers others the possibility of friendship with Jesus Christ, which says with confidence Jesus Christ is the answer to the question that is every human life, that church is living, and it's vibrant, and it's of service to society. Where the church has lost confidence in the gospel, where the church has simply become another non-governmental organization, you know, doing good works in society, that church mm -hmm. is dying. That's the fundamental divide in, in Catholicism today. And those who would lead the church, whether that's local churches— uh, or the universal church, it seemed to me, have got to wrestle with that fundamental truth uh, of the contemporary Catholic situation, which means, of course, that the path forward is the path that John Paul II called the new evangelization. Uh -huh. George, when I read the line, there was a line in the book and you, where you say, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, the Catholic future rooted in the Great Commission has stalled. And I thought to myself, is that because her, the, lay, the laity as well as the, the, the clerics have lost passion? It doesn't mean enough to them to even fight for it, much less to proclaim it or defend it? What do you mean that it's stalled, the Great well, Commission? Is, I, I, if you're thinking about the section that I'm thinking about. Uh, there are moments throughout the history of the church where the church's vitality lags, where the business of proclaiming the gospel, uh, bringing others into the fellowship of the Lord, seems to stall, seems to hit a rut, seems not to be going anywhere. Um, mm. That's, in a sense, to be expected. 
This is a church of sinners. Everybody in the Catholic Church is imperfectly converted. So there are going to be periods where we stall. The question is what we do when we're in that stall. Right. And I think in that same uh, passage of the book, I make mention of something that struck me with great force uh, in recent years. There are libraries full of books of church history, but there's only one divinely inspired history of the church. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. It's the fifth book in the New Testament. How does the Acts of the Apostles end? It ends with a shipwreck. But the shipwreck becomes the occasion for St. Paul to cooperate with God's providence in bringing the gospel to new places. So that's what we have to uh, understand in these moments when things seem to be sputtering a bit uh, or the engine seems to be stalled. Uh, there is a divine purpose still at work in the church, uh, and if we cooperate with with the grace of God, which we're promised will always be with us, uh, then we can get out of the rut, we can fix the stall, we can get the engine running again, and we can get about the business of the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. All nations. But we've got to understand yeah. that that Great Commission is addressed to all of us. Every Catholic on the day of his or her baptism was given the Great Commission. If we all understood that, we would be truly the Church of the New Evangelization. Mm -hmm. In the book you write, the Church of the 21st century will be a Christ-centered church, born of the gospel in full, or it will not be. Those who would lead the church must understand that. Why do you think they don't understand that today, George? Well, it's a real puzzle to me, Raymond. Look at Germany, for example. Um, yeah, what's going wreck. on in Germany today is sometimes called a slow-motion schism. I might even have used that term myself in a column or two. Mm -hmm. I now come to think that what's going on there is actually something far greater. What's going on there is close to apostasy. Uh, mm -hmm. Leaders of the church, people of the church, have simply ceased to believe that the gospel is true. And yet they have this huge institution funded by, a, uh, funded by the state through the, through the so-called church tax. So what do you do with it? Well, you turn the church into an NGO uh, in, in the good works business, some of which are indeed mm -hmm. good works. But that's not living the Great Commission. Wherever the church is dying, it's because of a lack of faith. And the Lord knew this 2,000 years ago. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? At the moment, he's having a hard time finding it in Dusseldorf and Munich and Berlin and a few other places. Mm -hmm. And that's a great sadness because there's, an, a, there's a wonderful tradition of Catholic life in the German-speaking world. Uh, German-speaking Catholicism is very generous in its support of the church in the third world. But there's a fundamental problem of faith, and when the faith is weak, the mission simply stops, and the church stops. Oh. Mm -hmm. George, uh, in our remaining minutes, you, you <laughs> write about papal protagonism in this book. What does that mean, and why do you hope we're going to see a bit more of it in the future? And I'm going to add this question to it. I know because you don't you don't li give a list of men you hope or, or uh, will be the next pope, or men you think should be the next pope. What should that pope look like, if you had to describe him? The next pope, uh, like his predecessors, will be successful <laughs> to the degree that he manifests in his own life. Uh, the joy of the gospel, the conviction that Jesus Christ is the answer to the question of, that is every human life. And that fellowship with the Lord is the royal road uh, to human flourishing. That, that's what we're looking for, uh, not only in the Pope, but in, in uh, the ordained leadership of the church, uh, and indeed mm -hmm. in, the, in the church. Um, actually, what I said is I think we need a little less papal protagonism in the sense oh, okay. that, uh, in the sense that um, 
Catholicism has become awfully popocentric over the last mm. uh, 150, 200 years. Um, that's not the entirety of the Catholic Church by any manner of means. And when you are focused so narrow on what the Pope is doing, what the Pope is saying, you may miss all of the other things that are going on in the Church that, that really could be enlivening yeah, and enriching. Uh, we don't, for example, spend anywhere near enough time examining the vitality of the Catholic Church in sub-Saharan Africa today. This, mm -hmm. this is an extraordinary story. But because we're so Rome-centered, uh, as in the United States, we're so presidency-centered, we miss all of the vitality that's going on elsewhere. I do think the next pope as his predecessors have tried to do, but the next one has to do it, try perhaps a bit harder, has to deliberately work to empower local Catholic leadership. The church mm. is mm. a very large and complicated business, and it cannot uh, be run in this evangelical sense simply by one man. We need mm. bishops, priests, religious lay leaders empowered by the successor of Peter to get about the business of the new evangelization. That's George, the future. You, you also, yeah, yeah, you, you also urge the next pope to be willing to remove errant bishops. Why? Why did you put that there? Why do you think that's been missing? Because it's necessary. Um, this is not always a case of wickedness, although sometimes it is, unfortunately. It's sometimes a case of simply a misfit or a man who has lost the capacity to govern for a variety of reasons. You know, Raymond, the church has spent the last 200 years gaining control for itself over the appointment of bishops. Pius IX, yeah, yeah. uh, for example, in the mid-19th century, had a very limited free appointment of bishops around the world. He was tied up by states appointing bishops, by uh, cathedral chapters appointing bishops, and so forth and so on. We now have reclaimed the right of the church to order its own life by the pope naming bishops. Well, if you're going to claim that right, then you have to claim the responsibility, you have to own the responsibility of removing the mistakes that are made. Uh, this is crucial for the Catholic future. You cannot have a Catholic church without bishops. You cannot have an evangelically vibrant uh, local diocese without a bishop uh, who has the credibility to be the leader of that diocese. So when that credibility is lost, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. uh, measures have to be taken to fix the problem. George, I mean, a, a final question. In the book, The Next Pope, you write and you warn several times. I found it several times throughout the book. Quote, the gospel cannot be set against doctrine or mercy against truth. Is that what, in your estimation, we've been witnessing in the last few years? It's something that we've been witnessing in various parts of the church for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a tendency in uh, many parts of the church to think that you can somehow separate truth from mercy uh, or gospel from doctrine. This always leads to trouble. The most merciful thing we can often do for people is help them understand the truth of their situation. Right, By the same them. token, that truth has to be spoken uh, with compassion, uh, with understanding. Uh, and, and the face of the merciful Father has to be displayed uh, before the world. It's not an either-or business. What we want, what we need, what the Lord wants, is both-and Catholicism, or as I've called it sometimes, all-in Catholicism. Not, not the pick-and-choose business where you, you, you know, try one right. flavor and then try another flavor. Right. George Weigel, I thank you for your time, your insight. The book is The Next Pope, The Office of Peter and a Church in Mission. It's available at bookstores everywhere and online. George, thanks again. Thank you, Raymond.
She has spent decades practicing pediatric and adolescent medicine and counseling teens and their parents. For Father's Day, she's here to discuss the crucial relationship between dads and their kids. It's the subject of her new book, You've Got This, Unleashing the Hero Dad Within. Here's my interview with Dr. Meg Meeker. There is this negative stereotype of dads that persist in the culture at large, and I think get in the heads of a lot of dads. Why does that continue, given what we're seeing in society, where in the African-American community, 70 percent of, of children have no dads at home? In the, in the white and Latino communities, 45 percent uh, are, are dadless homes. Why does this negative stereotype persist, and what happens to the kids left behind? Well, I think that's a great question. I think the stereotype of dads being sort of bumbling idiots who really aren't necessary in homes has been building over the past 20 years. And I think there are a lot of different re reasons for it. I think that the women's movement that started in the 1970s began all of that sort of saying, we're the ones that are important. Moms are the ones that are important. Dads aren't really necessary. And then media jumped on board and Hollywood realized, well, we can make a lot of money off of making the dads the butt of everyone's joke. Mm. Jokes. So it just kind of spiraled from there. And I think that as a pediatrician, one of the things that disturbs me the most about it is that I see firsthand the devastating effects on kids when they don't have either a dad engaged or a dad at home because the research is crystal clear that kids who have a dad in the home or very engaged in their lives, not a perfect dad, but a good enough dad, mm -hmm. do so much better in life. They, they, they finish high school, they go on to college, they have a higher self-esteem, they test better on tests, mm -hmm. less likely to be depressed, have anxiety, you name it. So it's a really important issue that I really think we need to address and that's exactly what I'm trying to do with You've Got mm -hmm. This. Now tell me, what is the big mistake dads make when they don't ask themselves, how do my kids see me? Why is that an important question? You pose it in the book. Well, yeah, it's very important because I think that pretty universally dads devalue their importance in their kids' lives. Dads very typically say to me something like this, you know, I really want to be a better dad, but I know I'm failing. And I think that it's very common for dads to see themselves as not doing a very good job. You know, I work with the NFL. I work with all sorts of dads mm -hmm. across the country. And I'd say the number one problem is that dads really don't see themselves through their kids' eyes, which is mm -hmm. you are critical to my development. You, dad, are the center of my world. Most dads don't know that and they don't feel like that. Mm. Why are, and tell me in what ways, are dads important to girls and then to their sons. What, what, are the, you know, dads, what do they look for? What, what do each sex look for from their dad? That's a great question. Dads play a very different role in a daughter's life and a son's life. We'll look at boys first. Mm -hmm. You know, boys are very visual people, and in order to grow up to be a good man, they need to see a good man in action. And a lot of men grow up and literally don't know how to act as a dad because they've never seen that. It's critically important for a boy to move into manhood by seeing a dad and feeling that he's valuable in his dad's mm -hmm. eyes. You know, a boy can feel good in his mom's eyes, and it's great. You can be a great mom to a son and do a really great job. Mm -hmm. But there's something about that father figure that makes a son feel very important and ve very valued as a man. A daughter, on the other hand, needs to um, re learn how to relate to men through her dad. She learns what it's like to be treated as a valuable woman. She watches how her dad treats her mother or other women, and she learns how her father treats her. And she, grow up, she grows up to expect good behavior from a boyfriend or her father if she's grown up with a father who treats her well. What's the secret about kids that dads often miss? You mentioned this secret, what is it? Yeah, I, I think the secret that dads often miss is that what kids really want in life and what really shapes their identity and great character 
is time with mom and dad. And I think that dads are so quick to sort of sign their kids up for soccer or football or dance or whatever, mm -hmm. believing that their kids will grow into great people as long as they have enough experiences outside of the home. But that's entirely untrue. Kids have told me over 30 years that what really makes them great people and changes who they become as adults is face-to-face -face time with their dads and their mothers, particularly their dads. You know, dads often feel, I think, um, uncomfortable and unsure, particularly in this Me Too moment. What would you advise dads? I mean, you know, it's as if masculinity has suddenly become toxic, and even the things normally wired into us to attract those of the opposite sex, uh, you know, are now somehow verboten. What do you tell dads? What do you instruct them in this particular moment that we find ourselves in? Well, I think it's really important for dads to push back against the anti-male sentiment. And it's real, it's strong, and it's gaining momentum. You know, I think the Me Too movement has really been hijacked. And there's a lot of anti-dad, anti-male, really male bashing out there, which really is devastating to young girls because girls grow up not trusting men, disliking men, and that's really confusing for girls because they desperately want to trust their dads, mm. to stay connected to their dads, to be loved by their dads. Mm. But if they grow up feeling, and, and, and men can't buy into this, that men aren't to be trusted, that's devastating to kids. So dads need to push back and they need to feel comfortable with their masculine identity and engage it. Don't be ashamed of it, be proud of it, be present, and you know, trust your instincts as a dad. You really can't go too far wrong if you keep doing that. I, I wanna shift gears a little bit. We've been seeing a lot of, in the news certainly, of high profile suicides. Uh, Kate Spade, mm. Anthony Bourdain. Uh, suicide is rising at an alarming rate. Uh, I read a study the other day where we're seeing a 25% increase in suicide. Why? Meg Meeker, and are you seeing this in the young as well? You know, I am, and I don't know if we've talked this about this before because you have done, you and I have done a number of things together. But anxiety in kids is rising in frequency, and it's occurring in younger and younger kids. The same is true with depression, and mm. I think there are a lot of factors. But primarily, remember. Depression in kids is about a sense of self-hatred, and kids learn to hate themselves when they feel unloved, when nobody spends any time with them, and when they feel very isolated, it, it, when mm. they live, if you will, in their own worlds. And yeah. with technology and screens, kids don't live engaged with their family and present. They live very isolated and disconnected, even though they can be in the same house. So. Yeah isolation, loneliness, sadness, feeling like they're not valued or loved is mm -hmm. really what drives a lot of depression in kids. Do you recommend banning devices in the bedrooms to keep everybody in public areas and in the den and in the family room? Oh, absolutely. You know, parents should know, even parents of 18-year-olds, should, should know what their kids are looking at, what they're doing, how much time they're spending on devices. And I think a lot of parents feel overwhelmed and they think there's no way I can know what my kids are doing, but you know you can. You've got to scan what your kids are looking at and what you're doing. And actually, I think spouses should do that. You know, you mm -hmm. don't live with secrets in your home. That's what makes a great marriage and that's what makes great parent daughter and parent son relationships is mm -hmm. everything's in the open there's accountability and you really mm -hmm. can help protect your kids and even teenagers need to be protected from themselves and what comes across devices what would be your final bit of advice not for dads but for those around dad for moms and the kids to make that man a better dad change the way you talk to the man or the father in your life you know men need respect to be great men and great fathers and i think that women fall down over and over and i found this with myself by talking down to men criticizing them so turn that 
speak up to men, respect men, be polite to men. If you do that as a wife in your home, you're teaching your children to do that as well. Dads get better and the whole family gets stronger. Hmm. And, and what are dads missing in your estimation as you watch them? What are they not doing that they should be doing in family life, both to their, to their sons and their daughters? Or with their sons and their daughters? I think it's real... I think it's really simple, Raymond. I think they need to show up and they need to be present. Mm -hmm. they, when they walk in their homes at night after a day of work, turn off your cell phones. Understand your kids are reading you constantly for information about how you see them. If you look them in the eye, if you talk to them, if you listen to them, if you engage them, even 10 minutes more a day, your relationship with your child will will improve 180% for sure. Dr. Meg Meeker, you're always great. Thanks for being here. Come see us again. You've got this Unleashing the Hero Dad Within by Dr. Meg Meeker is available at bookstores everywhere and online. He was nominated for an Oscar in his role as Lieutenant Dan in the 1994 Forrest Gump. He's also an Emmy winner, a family man, musician, philanthropist, working on behalf of our nation's fighting men and women. In his memoir, Grateful American, A Journey from Self to Service, he talks about how he found that calling. Here's my interview with Gary Sinise. Why do you subtitle the book A Journey from Self to Service? Well, uh, I didn't know what the book was going to be called when I, when I started to write it, but as I started to pour through it, uh, you know, these recurring themes started to come out, gratitude, appreciation, and I realized that this memoir kind of tracked uh, my life through the time where I was focused on this singular sort of acting thing mm -hmm. that I was doing and building a theater company and, you know, the things that were around my small world and that it evolved into this broader mission story mm. of... of service to others, which I'm, I'm very much involved in now mm -hmm. uh, because of my foundation, the Gary Sinise Foundation and everything. So it really is. That's, that's exactly what the book is. Mm -hmm. I am a grateful American, and it is a journey following uh, this, this road from yeah. kind of a self-focus to a broader service focus. You open the book, uh, and you title the, the prologue Stunned, and it's, it's about a, a seminal event that happened about 25 years ago that confirmed you in what's become your life's mission, your work. Tell me about that moment. Yeah, I wanted to start the book with something and, and then kind of go travel mm -hmm. back. So I started yeah. with a kind of a pivotal moment, uh, an important moment uh, that sort of really stunned me yeah. <laughs> in a way when I walked in to the Disabled American Veterans National Convention 25 years ago this mm -hmm. summer. And uh, they had seen Forrest Gump. It had just come out about a month before, and they'd mm -hmm. seen Lieutenant Dan. And this is an organization that advocates for, they m might have two million members that are all wounded veterans. Oh. And uh, they invited me to their national convention. I walked in, and I was so emotional to receive their acknowledgement. They wanted mm -hmm. to acknowledge me for playing a disabled veteran in what they consider to be a positive way. And you know, 2,000 wounded veterans cheering you on, that, that was very emotional. It, yeah. I never forgot it. You, you, you talk in the book also about your grandfather's service. You take us way back uh, in the book. And you had family who were veterans, your wife's family as well. Um, tell me a sense of how that laid the groundwork for this concern and heart you have for military men and women and their families. Well, it's funny, when I was a kid, um, my, you know, and my dad was in the Navy in, in uh, the early 50s, and I was, I was born in 55. He got out of the Navy in 55. I was born, uh, I was conceived here at Anacostia oh. uh, on the naval base there, and that's where my dad was stationed. He was working in the film lab uh, as a naval, a photo mate is what mm. they called him. And that's where he learned the film business. He moved, uh, uh, my mom went back, she left, she was pregnant, she went back to Chicago, said, I'm going to have the baby there. Uh, he got out of the Navy about a week after I was born. Um, and then he went into the film business in Chicago, started working in the film business. His dad had served in World War I, and his mm -hmm. two older brothers served in World War II. 
So I've got this family on my side of the family of veterans, mm. but I never really talked to them too much about their yeah. service when I was a young kid. It was really when I met my wife and she introduced me to her brothers who had served in Vietnam, Vietnam in the yeah. U.S. Army. Her sister was in the Army. Her sister married a Vietnam veteran who was in the Army for 22 years, combat medic in Vietnam. They were the ones that uh, sort of you know, started to talk to me about military service and what it was like to be a Viet Vietnam veteran, mm -hmm. serve in the jungles, and then come home mm -hmm. to a nation that uh, really didn't treat them very well. And they had to kind of recline into the shadows a bit. Um, I felt very badly for our Vietnam veterans. And so in the early 80s, I just started to do some things in Chicago to support them in different ways. And that sort of planted the seeds a little bit for what would happen in the 90s when I had the opportunity to, to audition for Forrest Gump and then play a Vietnam veteran. I very much wanted to do that because of the military veterans in my own family. Mm. And that led me to start working with our wounded and and it's all, yeah. it all turned. There was a turning point. There's a chapter in the book called Turning Point, right. which is the September 11th attack. Mm -hmm. That was a real turning point for me, and I, I started moving into, into the service work that I haven't stopped. Hmm. No, it really, it arrested. People who were not there at the time don't remember what that moment did to the entire country. I mean, it was a shock to the whole system of the country. No but question. to those who were... Uh, dealing, who had first responders in their family or were in any way involved with the, the, the victims of 9-11 of or uh, the New York scene, it became very real. The, the threat, the danger, and how fragile the freedom we took for granted was. I, I write about that in the book, the, the fear that I had after that, that event. I mean, it was terrifying, yeah. you know, to watch those buildings come down, watch people fall from those buildings, watch you know, what was happening in the Pentagon and, and Shanksville and all the, and, and then remember uh, shortly after that, all of a sudden anthrax is floating right. through the mail and everything. I mean, the, the, it was crazy. It was a yeah. very paranoid time. Everybody was on yeah. edge yeah. and I was on edge and my heart was broken. I just, I just wanted to do something. And I remember, I think I told you this one time, yeah. uh, Friday after the Tuesday of September 11th was a national day of prayer. Hmm. George Bush said, everybody, <clears throat> we need to do something together as a country. I want uh, Friday to be a national day of prayer. The churches were packed across the country. I went to our little church, little Catholic church, and there was no room to sit. I mean, I was standing against the wall with my family. Every space was filled. And I remember coming out of that feeling that, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it was, it was comforting, but I, I needed to do something beyond that. And I heard this calling, this thing, this message that came to me about service mm. and the healing power of service work. Mm. And uh, that made a lot of sense to me. So I started raising my hand, you know, for the USO mm. and, you know, what can I do for your military mm. charity? Can I come and raise money for you? Can I draw mm. some attention to you? Uh, do some PSAs, whatever it is. Uh, play concerts for the troops, yeah. and, and it just started to go like this. And there's a period in, in that service history where you look at it, and it's like I was gone every weekend doing wow. something. And I was shooting a television show at the same I, time. Yeah. So it was a crazy period, but I really, I was getting so much out of making an impact by letting people know that I cared about them and I appreciated them. and. Mm. And the war got worse, remember. There, right. there was a time where Walter Reed was just filled to the Act. gills with wounded, yeah. and they didn't know where to put them. There were so many. Hmm. And uh, during that period of time, I was going to the hospitals all the time, meeting a lot of the families of our wounded, meeting our wounded service members, trying to come up with some ideas uh, in, in ways to help them. Yeah. And, and so I started raising money. I started uh, getting into home building, where we would build specially adapted homes for Those our wounded. Incredible. And it all ma manifested itself into the creation of the Gary Sinise Foundation, which is toward the end of the book. Yeah. You see the service journey into this full-time nonprofit that is devoted to serve and honor the needs of our military men and women and, and first responders. Yeah, and yeah. we're getting great things done at the mm. Gary Sinise Foundation. No, I, I've seen it up close. Now, I want to talk about it in a moment. I want to, you, go, you get into your career as well, and I, I want to back up a little bit. Uh, in high school, and this I didn't know, in high school, you were not exactly the straight arrow 
that people think you are today, Gary Sinise. <laughs> I mean, you were, you were doing pot, you were selling it. Uh, a little scrape with the law after you signed on to be in, in West Side Story. What happened there? Where did this acting bug come from during that period? Well, I had a, I had a lot of trouble as a kid. I, I never learned um, properly, I don't think, how to read and write. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I've, I've gotten better over the years, yes, obviously. You have, I, I yes, wrote you, a book. You've written a book now. My so. high school teacher is amazed. You know, this kid wrote a book. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, you can put words together. You see that? They make sense. And when she first met me, I, uh, you know, I was just bumbling around. And, and um, you know, I was having trouble. We, my, I tell this story in the book where, where we moved from town to town a little yeah. bit, right in those, in those years where you're, you know, you're developing a lot of friends and mm -hmm. you're making friends. And then all of a sudden we uprooted and moved and I had, to, I had to, you know, I was, had to make new friends. And that was, that was a struggle. Mm -hmm. I played in rock bands. I got into trouble with a lot of things yeah. that I write about a little yeah. bit in the book because it, it you know, I do hope that, uh, you know, somebody who might be going through a similar thing can see that there is light mm -hmm. at the end of the tunnel and if you, you can turn yourself around. And I was lucky. I was, you know, in, in some ways, I don't know, I happened to be standing in a hallway and this drama teacher walked down the hall uh, when I was a sophomore in high school and she told me to come and audition for West Side Story because I looked like a gang member and she <laughs> thought I'd be good in the show. And so I did. I oh. went and auditioned. And... I got in the show, mm. and all of a sudden I discovered here's this aimless kid who's really, really troubled, having a lot of trouble adjusting, and all of a sudden I found this community of kids that I loved, and I just loved doing the play, and I wanted, that's all I wanted to do, so yeah. I, uh, I just auditioned for every play I could after that, oh. and it, you know, as soon as I got out of high school, I started a theater. I wanted to keep doing it. No, and, not any theater. You start the Steppenwolf Theater Company, which is now this iconic uh, institution in, in Chicago. but we it's were kids. Yeah, in the beginning, it's you mm -hmm. and Laurie Metcalf and John Malkovich, um, yeah. your pals, and you're doing these shows together. <clears throat> what was it like in those early years? I mean, you all were all learning at the same time, I imagine. Yeah, my, uh, in West Side Story. And your wife, Moira, who was also she a She was an early yeah. member, yeah, yeah, 1976. In West Side Story... Uh, the guy was playing Tony, the lead. You know, I was one of the chorus guys. Yeah. I, was, I was a shark. You know, Pepe. <clears throat> yeah, Pepe the shark. <laughs> and the guy who was playing the lead was Jeff Perry. Oh. And Jeff and I became best best friends. And uh, he was very different than me. He was a guy who carried a, a million books around, and he had glasses, and <laughs> read Chekhov, and Stanislavski, and stuff. I didn't know what any of that was. Yeah. And I was just a rock and roll kid, you know, uh -huh. but we really connected and we hit it off. And after high school, uh, I just wanted to keep doing plays. So I started this comp little company with some of the high school kids. And Jeff had gone off to college to Illinois State University, and I told him about this. And so for his summer break, he came up to do a play with this little community mm -hmm. com company. Uh, a play called by Tom Stoppard called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead. And he had made very good friends with another guy at, at uh, ISU named Terry Kenny, who was another great actor. So he said, I'll bring Terry with me, and he'll be in it too. And so, <laughs> so Terry came up, and the three of us really bonded during that, that uh, experience. And we said, you know, when you guys get out of college, we're going to pick this up again and do something mm. with it. So couple years later, they get out of college, and we find a space in the basement of a closed-down Catholic school. They, the, I, I went to the priest, and I said, "Can you know, I'm a little kid. <laughs> Can we have your basement and put on some plays? And he said, sure. And, you know, it was closed down. They weren't doing anything with us. He, he, he said he'd give it to us for a dollar a year, wow. just a write-off. And so we built an 88-seat theater in this basement of a Catholic school in Highland Park, Illinois, and we recruited uh, six more people, and Laurie Metcalf, Moira Harris, John Malkovich, Alan Wilder, H.E. Bacchus, and Nancy Evans. And we became the original nine members of Steppenwolf. And from there, it just, it just kept growing and growing and growing. Then we moved into the city of Chicago mm -hmm. and built our own building. And now we're about to break ground on another building. And, you know, it's 45 years old now, that, that theater. Unbelievable. Did you ever expect Lieutenant Dan to do what it's done and why has it resonated in the way it has all these years later? I mean, generations now, we're talking about multiple generations now 
that see you as Lieutenant Dan, and that gives you a certain credibility in addition to your work in the in the veteran community. You know, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, can you? It, it's it, you can think of a few movies that are constantly. You see them every right. year. They're always on television. It's, you know, it's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. It's on every year, right. and new Wizard generations yeah. wa watch very, it. There's very a few, few of them. Forrest Gump seems like it's on television all the time. Somebody is always texting me, hey, I'm watching Gump on TV right now. <laughs> and it seems like it's never quite left the consciousness mm -hmm. in some way. Uh, so new generations of kids are seeing Forrest Gump. I'll go and play for these, concert, uh, these concerts on military bases. There'll be 5,000 people out there. Mm. They're all screaming Lieutenant Dan at me. And I, I'll ask them, you know, how many people here have seen Forrest Gump? And everybody cheers. And then I'll, then I'll say, is there anybody uh, over, you know, over 10 who hasn't seen that movie? And, and you know, it's very quiet. Nobody wow. Said it. People, do, I don't know if they're just embarrassed or what, but they, <laughs> it seems like everybody's seen the film. And so it's, it's always there. And when I started going out for the troops, I hadn't, I hadn't had CSI New York yet. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't on television every week. And, and uh, mm -hmm. I, had done, I had done some movies, but I was still kind of that, the guy, you know, mm -hmm. the guy who played this guy and the guy yeah. who played that guy. People didn't know my name. But they knew Lieutenant, Lieutenant Dan. Lieutenant Dan. And they recognized me from that. And that's mm -hmm. why I named my band after the character. Yeah. Uh, I figured, well, if they don't know my name, they'll know Lieutenant Dan. They'll know Dan. Lieutenant Dan or they'll figure it out. And they have. Thanks. Tell me, when I covered the Snowball Express this past Christmas, it blew me away. I have to tell you, it's not at all what I expected to see. I thought we'd have a bunch of kids having a good time at Disney World. But it really is, it's a therapeutic moment. You, you tried to explain it, but, but you have to experience it and see yeah. it. And um, what, what goes through your mind when you see these people discovering each other in their shared pain and in the pain that they alone understand, these families of veterans who've lost their lives? Um, and, and what do you say to them? Well, it's humbling, you know. It, it, I mean, it, it, in, in and it's moving, and <clears throat> I just embrace them and let them know that I love them and that I care about them and that they're not alone. That's that's the thing about this particular event when yeah. we bring all the kids together mm -hmm. and the families. These are kids that, that live all over the country in little right. towns or wherever it is. They mi they might be the only military family in that town, and they lost their mom or their dad in military mm -hmm. service and that child is going through something that not, none of the other kids are going through. Right. But when they come together with this event that we do every year for these children and they meet all these uh, over a thousand other kids that have all gone through this grieving of losing you know a mom or a dad in military service mm -hmm. they they really feel like they're in a community, like they're in a family, like mm -hmm. they're not alone, and they make lasting friendships. I mean, these kids give each mm -hmm. other their numbers, and then they go off to the little yeah. towns, and they stay in touch with they each do. other. And they meet and up the following year. Oh, it's a network of, of friends that are made. And every year, unfortunately, there are new kids. Mm. You know, there are new families that lose somebody, mm. and we bring them in. Uh, there are some kids that uh, have been coming for a while, and when they get to be 18, they sort of graduate. Yeah. And we make room for other kids. Because every year there's over 1,000 kids that we do this with. This, yeah. this year that you came was the first year that we've taken them to Disney World. Yeah. And it was the first year that it, the, the entire thing is part of the Gary Sinise Foundation. Mm. Uh, I've been doing it since 2007. It was its own organization for right. a while. And then when we made the deal with D Disney, you we were going to have to raise in. some additional money. Mm -hmm. And we thought the best way to do that was to bring it under our umbrella. Mm. And we were able to raise the money. So that's just one of our initiatives at the Gary yeah. Sinise Foundation, just putting our hands on our Gold Star families and making sure that they know they're not alone. Yeah. It's, it's tough. You know, it's tough for them. And we want them to to heal. I'm going to show people this little clip of video um, that your foundation released this week. It went viral. And it is people thanking you, being grateful for your work. Watch this. Thanks, Lieutenant Dan. I just want to thank you for everything that you do. And your foundation helped me and my family recover from the devastating Tubbs fire. Not only me and my family, but also hundreds of other firefighters.
Give me a reaction to that when you saw all those people thanking you. Well, first it was a shock because I was surprised by it. My team mm. kind of pulled yeah. a fast one on me, and, and uh, they, they were sneaking around behind my back, <laughs> like, getting everybody to send in videos, yeah. and they were putting it all together. And they, they, they had it perfectly planned for, to, to show it to me on the day that my book launched. Mm. And so we're on, on this book tour, and you know, we're in the hotel room, we're about to leave to go do some more interviews, and they, you know, I'm like in a hurry yeah. and everything. They made me sit down. You <laughs> need to watch it. this. Yeah, I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? So they made me watch it, and the first, first one up is Jay Leno, and he starts talking to Gary. Hey, Gary. You know, I'm like, what's this? And then, then Ron Howard comes on, and then another, and it keeps going on, and there are first responders there, and there are military folks from around the country and overseas, and, and there are Gold Star children, and, and some of our wounded uh, yeah. that we've done houses for. Yeah. And it's, I, I'm thinking about it, and I, I get choked up just, yeah. just thinking about it, because it, it, it was very, very touching and very moving and overwhelming, I mean. Yeah, no, it was a beautiful. Just to experience. see that people did that for me, I mean. Yeah. I'm a grateful American. There's yeah, well, no and, and people are grateful <clears throat> for you. I mean, the response I saw on social media was unbelievable. I gotta ask you this before I let you go, because you talk about it in the book. It seems as if, and you told me moments ago, this is really a calling from God for you. And that's how you see it, this work you're doing. I, I feel called to service for sure. Um, and, and there was there were these key moments along mm -hmm. the way, you know. And I can, I, you know, I talk about that a little in, in the book, that that moment where our priest uh, on, on the Friday after September 11th attacks, everybody is just in so much pain. You know, yeah. people are just crying through every day. Yep. You know, it, recalling the images that we all saw on television mm -hmm. and the things that are happening. Everybody was fearful and I remember the priest getting up and the first thing he said was this this was a tough week. Mm. And he was right on the money. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody it was a tough week for everybody. Yeah. It was a tough week for me and and and, and it continued to be tough. Mm -hmm. And I continued to be in pain. And uh, something I got out of that homily that day was that uh, service is a great healer. Mm. Serving others is a great healer and we should all pull together to do something positive for somebody else to help them through this terrible time. Yeah. And having veterans in my family and having been involved with the DAV and the disabled veterans and everything, uh, and and remembering what it was like for our Vietnam veterans to go off to war and then come back and not have services provided for them, not have the country embrace them and right. welcome them home. They got it, they didn't even get a welcome home. And then seeing our deploying troops go to Afghanistan and Iraq and watching our nation start to divide itself yeah. in whether they supported the war or not, I felt terrible for Mm. our deploying service members and I yep. knew that was where my calling was going to be. Mm. I was going to be called to do this service yep. work to help them through this difficult time of deploying to the war zone in reaction to September 11th. And once I started, the healing began mm. and I could see the impact I was making and I just, I wanted to embrace every, every family member, every person that was deploying, every first responder that I could. Grateful American by Gary Sinise is available in bookstores everywhere and online. To learn more about Gary's work, go to GarySiniseFoundation.org. He, he does an incredible service to so many. As we mentioned last week, the 16th anniversary Memorial Mass in honor of Maddie Stepanek will be celebrated virtually so everybody can take part. It's free. On Monday, June 22nd at 9 a.m. Eastern, you can check it out on Facebook Live. All the information is at maddiematters.org, maddiematters.org. It'll be a great event. And school's out, 
and Summer's Here. All three installments of the Will Wilder saga are now available in paperback and audiobook. Visit willwilderbooks.com for a preview, and you can order yours. You can also get it from the EWTN Religious Catalog. And don't forget, The World Over is available as a podcast. Visit Apple's iTunes podcast store. We're there on World Over. That is all the time we have this week. We hope you'll join us next week. A happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.